Hey, everybody, it's Jen Hatmaker here, host of the For the Love podcast. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. Oh, man. Today's interview. I just finished it and I just told her that was amazing from beginning to end. Like right when I thought, oh my gosh, she has given so much goodness in this interview. She pulls a story out at the very end. And I was like, what? Anyway, let me back up. We're in a series called For the Love of Embracing Change. (laughs) And so we're going to deep dive here into both the joy and the grief of change. And that is change sometimes that we choose. And sometimes it's change that chooses us. But either way, here we are, right? Like one minute we're high kicking with joy. Sometimes like as this hope of change washes over us when we're choosing it. And then even inside that paradigm, wiping our eyes, like, oh, this brought an unexpected grief that I wasn't really ready for. Um, And we're also during this series going to be asking the gurus, what are the mechanics of change? How do we set ourselves up for the best experience inside of it? Um, Because look, one way or another, however it comes to us, change is sure. We're all going to experience it. I mean, it, 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 it could be a healthcare diagnosis. Um, it could be somebody that leaves our life. It, Whatever it is, we want to know that we can handle it when it comes um, and begin creating sort of this posture toward change. That means we are both more able to choose it when it should be chosen and also more able to handle it when it chooses us. Right. And so, I mean, Lord knows I have had changes in my life in the last four years, more changes than I would have ever signed up for and more than I would have known I could handle. Like if you would tell me on the front edge, these are all the things that you are going to experience, discover, know, and have to create. I just don't, I just don't know. It would have been too much information for me. But looking backward on it now, I can see this posture toward resiliency and risk and hope and recreation that makes it all possible. So anyway, okay, you guys, let's get to it. Because today we're going to talk to such a talent. Um, She chose change. I mean, in every way. You'll hear. She completely like I told her, it was a yard sale. Everything went for sale, every category. And she moved into the life that she knew it was time to step into. Um, She knew that change for her was mandatory for her sanity, for her happiness, for her joy. And she made every choice along the way to get there. And she writes about the whole thing. Um, The joy and the mess that comes with pursuing a fresh start in the middle of life. Oh man, man, oh man, oh man. You guys, today we have Joy Sullivan. She's a poet. She's a community builder. She's an author. Joy has a master's in poetry, so she's no chump from Miami University. She is, she served as the poet in residence for the Wexner Center for the Arts. She leads international writing retreats and she's guest lectured in classrooms from Stanford to Florida International. Like she is legit. Joy's also the founder of Sustenance, which is a community designed to help writers like both revitalize and nourish their craft. Um, so if you want, God, by the way, listeners, if you want inspiration on the creative life, Joy writes a Substack newsletter called Necessary Salt. And her new book is called Instructions for Traveling West. It is brilliant. And I'm going to tell her, and you'll hear in a minute, how I stumbled upon it. Bootleg essentially, before it even came out. It releases on April 9th. I can't say enough good things about it. Um, her poetry has, I. this was last year that I discovered Joy, and I have since followed every single word she writes. And her work has meant so much to me. And I, 
this is the kind of poetry I love most. As you know, I have a um, <laughs> developing and meandering relationship with poetry that I've been nurturing for the last four or five years. And this is my favorite iteration of it. And so this whole conversation, you guys, I don't think you're ready. I, I don't know that you know what you're about to get out of this conversation. Let me just say it like this. For anybody who is experiencing change, who wants to experience change, who has any fear or experience around leaving and leaping, this is your conversation. Like, I'm so excited for you to listen to it. And by the way, if if you would like to watch this conversation, we always video record every episode on the show. So you can go to my YouTube channel and you can watch this conversation if you'd like to and see the beautiful Joy with her clear blue eyes. <laughs> um, otherwise, I'm so delighted to be in your little AirPods and I am actually so excited for you to hear this conversation. So um, please enjoy this fascinating and deep and encouraging discussion with the absolutely wonderful Joy Sullivan. Joy, I am, as I just told you, so delighted to meet you like face to face, to have you on the show. I have been like this girl peeking like in the windows of your work for the last year going, how on earth did I miss Joy? Like, fine. I'm so happy to be in your orbit. Um, thank you for coming on today. My God, it's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Jen. Let me tell you how I found you. Well, I, I should have like um, dug into my own story a little bit because I can't remember who posted, but some other, somebody else that I'm following, that's not you, um, posted one of your poems from your upcoming book, literally not even published yet, not even out on a shelf yet. Um, and it was the one about leap. And I, I'm I'm in a I'm in a space I'm in an emotional space and I'm also in a writing space so I'm I'm in this like creative place where I am thinking some of those thoughts that you penned in that poem like I screenshot it I emailed it to myself I'm like I saved it in my Instagram files I'm like first of all that poem cut right through to me second of all I was like who's joy. <laughs> and I came right over to you, followed you immediately. And I have already put that little poem in a little segment of the book I'm writing right now. And I'm like, well, I don't even, I can't even cite it yet because her book's not out. Um, but I will, I will, sis, you're a real talent. Uh, thank you so much, Jed. It's so exciting to hear how you found me and how we got connected. That poem has like been this lightning alchemy to other amazing women. So I'm so happy we got connected. I know it. I am too. And, and your, the book that it is embedded in comes out. I mean, we'll be, we'll be right at the airtime when it comes out. The ninth, is it the ninth, is it April, April 9th? 9th, baby? Yeah. How are you feeling? I'm so excited. I'm excited and nervous and uh, it's kind of surreal. It's just a wild thing to bring a book into the world for the first time, but I'm just, I'm so excited to to watch this book travel. It's going to go. Um, you, you write about so many universal themes and kind of where our hearts are and where they've been and where they're going. And it's so resonant. So before we get into some of that, for my community, who may be new to you today, could you just like, for, first, can you come up to like the 30,000 foot view for my community and just say, okay, this is who I am. This is my deal. Um, this is where I'm at. This is kind of why I'm here. Um, and then we'll sort of funnel down into some of um, some big ideas that I want to talk to you about. Sounds great. Well, thank you so much for that, Jen. It's such an honor to be here. Again, my name is Joy Sullivan. I am the author of Instructions for Traveling West, which is a book of poems that's all about leaving and leaping. And 
the catalyst for writing that book was really uh, going west myself and starting this whole process of self-discovery. And through that, beginning to take a series of leaps in my life. So leaving a relationship, leaving my corporate job, becoming an entrepreneur, and now becoming an author um, of poems, right? Which is like getting poems in the world, which is sometimes a hard thing to do. Um and so that that is what I that's what I'm what I'm up to these days. I'm also a community founder, um, and I, it's just really exciting to get to connect with other people who are in a similar launch or pre-launch phase of their life. I think everybody in the pandemic began to ask, "Is this all there is? Am I am I doing the things that are meaningful?" And so I think that's one reason the book really resonates is because we all came to this place of, "Am I?" It, Life is so freaking short if, as if we needed that reminder again, we got it. And I think that book was trying to grapple with what now, what next. This um, series that we're in right now on the show is about um, change. <laughs> and you literally just described in one sentence about four comprehensive, complete sea changes in your life, just all. And so Let's go back, if you don't mind, and uh, let's pick, let, pick them all. Uh, you talked about your corporate job. You talked about leaving a relationship. You're going to, I mean, go from some sort of steady, predictable space to like, guess what? I'm a poet now. That's my job. It's going to pay the electric bill. Like, um, And then, I mean, you just touched on it, but traveling West is literal. And so can you just go back a little bit and parse each of those out just a little, because when we are talking about making changes, you went for it. I mean, you really did. Like you're not, this isn't theoretical. You are not sort of hypothesizing. What if we did? What if we said maybe you did the thing? So it's fascinating. And I'd love to hear it from your own mouth. Yeah, absolutely. Well, for me, it really started mid pandemic. We were about a year in and I was working remote remotely at a corporate job. And I decided to, to like do that somewhere more beautiful than Ohio, which is where I was living at the time. No offense to Ohio, but I, I just wanted to be in like really natural and wild spaces. So I started driving West and I spent six weeks hiking in Sedona, being in the, the beautiful desert. And during that time, I really had the sense of awakening and the sense of rupturing. And it was that question, like, am I doing work that matters? And I was so awake to my life again in that like intense way that loneliness just like pricks us alive. And I, I really began to grapple. I just looked at every aspect of my life and said, could there be more? And I wrote this poem in the desert. I remember the day I'd done it. I had just like burnt through all my courage from the day traveling alone as a woman. I'd fallen down like the sand dune. I had almost run out of gas. There were just all these things. And so I got home and, and I just wrote this poem called Instructions for Traveling West, which begins, as you know, first you must realize you're homesick for all the lives you're not living. Then you must commit to the road and the rising loneliness. And I wrote it sort of as like a, like trying to hype myself up to keep going because it was so scary and isolating. I mean, I go through whole days without seeing another person. And so in that incredible and beautiful silence, I feel like I gave myself the gift of hearing what it was that my heart, my mind, my body was asking for. And when I really listened, it's terrifying. I heard a lot of things that I hadn't wanted to hear. And it was that I needed to make radical shifts in my life. And so, you know, it's, it, you have to be careful what you write down, Jen, because it really performs this kind of beautiful, terrifying magic. I, within 40 days of writing that poem, Jen, I had sold my house and was in a car with my two cats traveling to Portland, Oregon, where I knew absolutely no one. And I had called off a relationship with a man who wanted to marry me. And I was halfway out of my corporate job at that point. And what is amazing is it's really terrifying, but... What is so interesting to me is for the last three years that I lived in Ohio, I had a nightmare every night. I would wake up from it that uh, like at 4 a.m. in the morning that my body was literally decomposing in a barrel of water. And the morning Whoa. I left. Yeah. Right. 
And the morning I left Ohio, that dream never returned. I have goosebumps. So I think sometimes our bodies know, our bodies know. I, I did not learn to even listen to the wisdom of my own body until I would say literally in the last five years, I didn't know that she was a source of wisdom. I was always taught to distrust whatever my instincts were, or that quiet thing, just like hammering. I'm like, no, you're not, you don't make sense. That's not reasonable, right? Like that's not advisable. So uh, to hear you tell it like that, all in 40 days to have those rocks tumbling downhill. Holy moly. Did you have to keep talking yourself into it? Or once you committed to the path, were you like, I know what to do? Honestly, I, well, I'm a, I'm a a anxious, terrified person all the time. So the fear was always present, but the, the road, the road appeared. It, it appeared. I don't think that I could have not walked down it once it became obvious to me. I was scared, but I knew I had to do it because I knew whatever had me in its teeth, whatever instinct or intuition, intuition was pulling me forward. It wasn't going to let me go until I followed, I followed forward. And, you know, I think that we forget sometimes, like you were talking about this sense of instinct and intuition, like we're creatures just like the rest of the world. And how do the birds know when it's time to, to migrate and fly south or, or move out of a habitat or find a safer space? And I think our bodies know too. And I think that's what I woke up to in this just radical way that wasn't going to let me go until I followed. Oh my gosh. Did you have one of those silos that was scarier than another? I mean, because really and genuinely, you left no stone unturned. It was career. It was relationship. It was location. It was vocation. Like it, it, there wasn't anything left standing. Um, were you, were, was one of them harder than the other? I'm thinking about my listener right now, whose little heart is like drumming in her little chest right now going, mm, my God, I know that voice. I know that nightmare. I know that sense of feeling trapped and stuck that I need to make a change. I'm curious. And of course, this is subjective, depending on the person. But was one of those categories harder than the others? Yeah, for me, it was really letting go of the corporate job because I had been a high school English teacher before that. So uh, as much as I loved education, I moved into marketing and working at a branding agency in the corporate world because I I really wanted to feel stable after not making a ton as an educator. And that was very terrifying to me that, oh, I had built up this career and I had worked so hard to get these promotions and for so long. And, you know, I'm six or seven years in and suddenly I come to this this new conclusion that actually this work doesn't feel meaningless. Like we're in the middle of a global pandemic and I'm working on email campaigns. Like, is this the work with a capital W that I want to do? And I realized that I actually didn't, that it was poetry and language that I wanted to really be about in the world. And it felt almost too terrifying to let myself dream that that could be my life. And so I think that's for a lot of people. And it's a very real concern. Financial stability is huge. And I don't want to be naive in saying it's easy to just throw that out the window. It wasn't for me and it wasn't for a lot of uh, people listening. It won't be. But I had to really bet on myself that whatever in me was asking could also carry. God, did you, um, why did you pick Portland? Did you have a reason? Well, where you're like, what's as far that direction as I can get? Let's just keep driving till we hit water. Well, yeah. And I can't go any Uh further West really. Yeah, exactly. Hawaii. So that was pretty far, but also, you know, I started dating a bunch of different cities and I was actually going to move to Denver or Austin. And when I was visiting Denver, someone said, you know, I could see you in Portland. And I said, I'm not moving to Portland. That's so far. That's not even a direct flight to my family. And then I went and it just something clicked. I don't know if it was the ocean or the fact that everything is green here, but something just felt like, yeah, you can, you can see yourself here. And the other thing that it did is actually, I didn't have any connections here. And while that was terrifying and lonely for about the first year after I moved, it gave me this incredible gift of anonymity. So I could sort of become anyone I wanted 
to be within that space. And I didn't have any old narratives. I didn't have any truly friends or connections. It just let me sort of bloom open in this way that let me experiment and try on a lot of different ideas until I found really rooted in where I landed. And to be able at 36 to give yourself that gift is feels really special to say, how could I reinvent? And so Portland was really, I think I could have gone anywhere. I tell people, I don't think it matters where you go, but to be able to give yourself an opportunity to really reinvent, that's the good stuff. That's the rub. I want to talk about that idea of belonging in just a second, but I have one other question about this. Um, I am curious if you found yourself surrounded with uh, on the at the genesis of a lot of these changes when you are really just like it's a yard sale you are everything is going um you know bottom prices um did you have people around you who were like i love this for you this is the good decision i like what you're choosing i'm for you i think this is the right thing and or both did you also have people going this is so outrageous. This is not responsible. Um, I'm afraid for you. I don't know. I'm for me, it's sometimes the outside voices that are the, the obstacle to overcome chosen change. Um, I'm curious what that felt like to you to hear whatever you heard. And I'm, um, what did that look like? Oh, Jen, I love that phrase, chosen change. That's such an honoring of the sovereignty that is to make a decision. And, you know, I was raised in a household that it was very much like you got permission to do things. You, um, this idea of culpability was linked to this idea of sin, which was what made me very fearful for a long time of making a choice. And I even talk about this in the book, but it's this idea of culpability was really scary for me because how do I know that I'm making the right choice? And so, yeah, there were a lot of people that was like, you you know, you have this beautiful life in Ohio, you own your own house, you're with this really nice man, like what, what are you doing and why, why do you feel the need to blow that up? Like that's a chaotic thing to be about, but I would say that the people closest to me also recognized that it was time. Um, and even, even my mom was just incredibly, she just kept saying, I get it. I get it. And that's all I needed her to say was that like, like instinct recognized instinct. And so it was this knowing that like, wherever this goes, it's really important that you yourself make the choice and that you rest, that you made a choice, be it like beautiful or a mistake, but the power has to be that you begin to choose for yourself. And that's, I think, the magic of that decision for me. So for the person listening to you tell this bit, who they have their own internal knowing about what has run its course, what needs, what's in front of them, potentially, I mean, to whatever degree you know any of it, which might just be this much of it, um, but knowing this is something that my soul is telling me to do, but they are frozen. Um, in paralysis, in fear, in um, simply just the unknown, because you had no guarantees here. I mean, you didn't know if any of this was going to work. Um, what what would you say to that person? You, you you have the incredible benefit right now of a little bit of hindsight. Um, uh, this has fleshed out in your life now to some degree that you are able to self assess and kind of go, all right, what did this teach me? What did I? What would I? What? Okay, let, let me put it this way. What would you have gone back and told yourself when you were like clutched in fear that day, writing that poem in Sedona, lonely, unsure, spent, and a little frazzled? Like what, what advice would you have given that girl knowing what you know now? Yeah. 
Well, I think what I was doing and I didn't even realize that I was doing at the time was that I was inching towards the ledge. And maybe it's good that I didn't know I was even headed towards the ledge because I don't know if I could have done it. I don't know if I would have written that poem if I knew it was about to blow up my life, right? I'd been in a relationship that I probably needed to leave for a while and just hadn't left it because I couldn't look at it. So what's really interesting and what I tell people who say like, I, I don't know how to make a huge leap. And I'm like, don't make a huge leap. Orient yourself towards the ledge and go in incremental little shifts. It's just a posture of beginning to leap. I think it's really a big ask to say, blow up your life, do it all, jump into the magic dark. That can have its kind of um, an interesting urgency, but I think that's it unrealistic for a lot of people. I mean, I'm literally sitting at my writing desk right now and I look out every morning and I see these squirrels jumping from rooftop to power line to power line to pine tree. And I, I've always gotten really fascinated, like how do these squirrels know that they're gonna make these leaps, right? They just fling themselves off the roof and they always get caught. And I did a little research about squirrels because I was really, it was really bugging me. Like, why don't I see these squirrels fall? How do they know? And what I learned is that squirrels don't know. They misjudge the leap all the time. But what they do do is that they innovate midair and they figure out how to catch themselves if they misjudge the leap. And they use all of that data. They collect all of that memory, just like they collect acorns, to teach themselves how to jump further. And to me, there's just this like expansive metaphor present in that about us too. Like you don't have to get the leap right every time. You don't have to take the colossal jump, but what is one movement? If you wanna leave your corporate job, can you give yourself an exit ramp of nine months and say, I'm gonna take one step every day to move myself closer to that ledge and then I'm going to freaking leap, right? But I think it's the posture of beginning to leap and to stretching those muscles of courage that make us ready to go. And then once, before you know it, you're midair. And then those leaps get bigger and bigger. People say, wow, you're really courageous to me a lot. And I think, really? I don't think that I am. I think that I have slowly had a posture of beginning to leap for a long time. So now the muscularity of taking farther and farther leaps just gets a lot easier. So I think it's really important to not compare yourself to somebody who is mid their leap because there were probably a lot of scoots to the edge before they launched. That's so good. I want to talk, you're not a stranger to massive life upheaval. You've got some of this coded into your childhood, into your experience. Um, you know what it means to have literally left an entire place, a complete sense of belonging where you were and have to be in a totally new environment. I wonder if you could talk for just a moment about growing up and about um, what that looked like and when you left and why, and, um, and that maybe that was a bit of a, uh, uh, of the earliest path that you learned to walk, um, that kind of came back, rose back up for you later as an adult. Yeah. So my family lived uh, in Quebec and then Haiti and then Central African Republic when I was a girl. And we shifted a lot, right? So just like you were mentioning, a lot of that upheaval, it was kind of hardwired into me early on. And in 1996, my family was actually evacuated from our home in Central Africa because of warfare. And we relocated to Dayton, Ohio, which is sure. a culture shock, an obvious, right? An obvious choice. Right. right. You know, <laughs> yes. and so you go from like this beautiful tropical, jungle to literally the, the cornfields of Ohio. And then for me, just this, this incredible sense of loss and rupture um, and, and reinvention, like literally having to figure out then how to exist um, in a place where I now looked like everyone else, but I felt so dissimilar. I felt even less like I belonged than in the place that I had come to know as home. So yeah, I definitely think that idea of rupture, reinvention, starting over again is a survival skill that I also learned, but also this idea of the page, right? So not being able to speak the language for a lot of 
the years growing up, because we were in different countries, I came to the page a lot. And then I stayed with the page when we came back home um, or to Ohio, because that was the only place where I felt like I could really be understood or know myself in the midst of so much culture shock. Mm. Um, You mentioned it earlier um, when you talked about those um, lines about homes being homesick for all the lives we're not living. But the second sentence is really profound because you said you must commit to the road and the rising loneliness. And that is a tall order. It's true, but it's a daunting um, commission at the beginning of the road. And so having experienced so viscerally a sense of loneliness, as you just mentioned, having left the culture that you knew where even there, you, of course you were obviously different, but you had formulated a real sense of home. Um, and then to come to Ohio and be like, I literally don't, where's my, where's my place. (laughs) I can only imagine. Um, I'd like to hear you talk a little bit about what you mean by the important role of loneliness in this whole, whole gamut why does that matter? Why why is loneliness one of the ingredients? Yeah, it's so interesting because that was the the dark gift uh, of the pandemic was this supreme sense of loneliness. And obviously, we don't want to have to always stay in loneliness, but I think sometimes we reject it or ignore it, um, and we don't see it as the phenomenal teacher that it is. And for me, what loneliness has really offered throughout the pandemic and then throughout like literally multiple times of my life, moving to some place where I either don't know the culture, I don't know anyone, or I don't speak the language, is that you develop this intense sense of having to listen to who you are and what it is that you need. And sometimes it's in that unbearable stillness that we give ourselves a chance to really hear whatever it is that's asking to come out. And sometimes I just feel like if you're like me, it gets lost in that nine to five, the blare of everyday life, right? That din that's, you know, in traffic jams and buried in office meetings. And sometimes what loneliness gives us is this opportunity to really hear like, what is the other life? What is the next stage? What is the evolution that is asking me to be born? And I think, you know, nothing is as lonely as the desert in December and just getting to go to this place of utter stillness metamor uh geographically but also uh as a metaphor within myself was just this opportunity to hear myself in a way that I never had before so um I think you absolutely the loneliness of the road is something you just have to like sign up for as part of the evolution Mm. um I want to talk to you in a second about the craft of poetry and your particular gift for it but before we get to that um, I I wonder if we could dive over here for a second on some of these conversations about in the midst of all this, which is um, who you are, who, what you want to bring to bear in the world, like these really big questions that you are asking and then answering um, with your choices. There's also this baked in structure right in the middle of it, of the female experience in the midst of all of this, all the other stuff, all this change, all this, um, all these other North stars that you are following. And so, um, and you have a really specific background, your childhood, your faith structures that you grew up inside of. And uh, so before I ask you a couple of questions about that, could you just sort of because we just, we, we tapped down on it, but without really any details, talk about what, what those were, what did you grow up in? What sort of spiritual environment? And then some of the messages that you gleaned from that world as a human, but also as a girl. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, absolutely. So my parents were uh, Baptist missionaries. My dad was a general surgeon also, but we were uh, there in Haiti and then also Central Africa. My parents were there as missionaries. And so baked into that was a lot of uh, messaging about uh, gender, about obviously what it meant to live a spiritual life um and also the sense of like what it meant to be good and i think i really coded that into my psyche of what it meant to be good a good woman a good girl and that's that isn't a, a message that's only present certainly in uh more traditional evangelicalism but it's certainly a message that women internalize and that there's only one way to be good and it's to adhere to kind of of a very specific life path and expression of oneself. And so, you know, I think what was hard for me is as I got into my 20s and my 30s, I didn't have the life that I sort of felt like I had already, always should have had based on, you know, what a woman was supposed to get husband, kids, right? The stability of uh, the white picket fence, et cetera. And what's been interesting is when I sort of recreated or fractured some of those stories culturally and religiously that I had been given, my life just expanded into possibility because I it had never occurred to me that a woman could be really, really happy if she didn't choose those things, that was even an option, that you didn't have to feel this intense sense of shame or grief that maybe that was not the life that was gonna be given to you. And, and something really magical happened for me when I was able to let go of shame or grief that I hadn't gotten those things. I At the end of the day, I wasn't even sure that I actually wanted them. But it was this idea that, you know, good good Christian girls get certain things. And what's so powerful for me about the page is, is you get to subvert or crack open a story and figure out what you want to reinvent for yourself. And so part of the book is even looking at that character of Eve and sort of cracking open her story and saying, what's here in the margins? What's here if we would reinvent this uh, story and tell it a little bit differently? And so, um, yeah, I think that's that's where I've sort of netted out in, in how to unpack from a linguistic uh, perspective, some of the stories that I was given as a child and begin to deconstruct. And what do you see in the margins of that story? How do you envision that um, being reinvented, reimagined even? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in the middle of the book, it kind of does this funny rupture, this sort of, it begins with this very Edenic, pre-pandemic, idyllic, childhood world. And then it moves into the sense of rupture or cracking. And in the interlude of the book, the book departs from the usual themes of, of reinvention, travel, going west. And it tells this, this story in about 10 or 12 poems about Eve. And it's called, that interlude in the book is called Westward, A Woman Walks. And I was so fascinated by Eve because in my religious background, we always heard that, you know, it was all Eve's fault. She messed up. She she was responsible for the downfall of humankind. And the the I was in an airport once walking and I saw this woman with a piece of fruit in her hand. And I I in my little brain's eye was like, God, I wonder if that was Eve. And to reimagine her as this like almost jet setting woman who was traveling throughout time. She's literally the first woman to leap West to see her not as a fall, but as a leap was a lot of inspiration behind uh, this book and behind my own life of could I, could I take the stories, the narratives, the expectations placed on women, women, and could I totally subvert them to see what's possible for me and my own expression? And could I use my own language to tell that story a different way? So good. Um, that's just, it's such a generous reading. It's such a generous um, projection. And for me and a lot of people like me in this community who grew up in faith spaces, um, most of us kind of conventional, traditional gender roles, all of the whole thing, you know. Um, and of course, as you know, in our world, our aspirations were to be the, the, the tip top rung on the ladder was to be a missionary. So you did it. 
Um, <laughs> you had the top rung, like that was the pinnacle of faithfulness. And, um, you know, it, it was this idea that sacrificing whatever you actually wanted, um, was the way to please God. Um, so if that meant, I don't want to chase a dream here. I don't want to live in a little cozy community with like best friends. Like that was almost indulgent. Um, and so it is resonant to hear you talk about, um, rupturing that narrative and imagining what it could look like in a like joyful, incredibly like fulfilling way in the, in today's like modern world. I, I want to talk to you about one other aspect of that, which is, um, it, you wrote a poem called, I took my body out to dinner. It's so good. It's so good. Um, and you talk about this idea and also the challenge of women belonging to themselves first and foremost and forever. Um, this is a very new lesson for me that I have learned in the last four years, um, which for me felt revolutionary. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about it and what you have learned and discovered about treating yourself and your body and your soul with such great care. Yeah, that's such a lovely question, Jed, and something I feel like God, I'm almost 40 and I, it's still something I, how am I learning this so late in life? And it's like, uh, it's just like radical to, to finally feel like you begin to hold a different space for yourself than you have previously, especially as a younger woman. And for me, <laughs> I have never understood the concept of self-care and self-love. Um, it's super irritating when my therapist tells me to talk nicely to myself, like how that, that has never resonated or understood. Like I understand the concept, but I don't understand how to do it in practicality. And what really shifted for me, um, I think in stories and I think in metaphors. And a couple of years ago when I still lived in Ohio, what really expanded this idea of self and sovereignty and self-love was I lived across from a house that had two dogs and they kept these young dogs on their porch in cages. And I had, it took me a couple of weeks to realize that these dogs were not being well treated. And that eventually the more I watched, I began to really wonder and, and later realize that these dogs were being groomed for dog fighting. And there were two dogs, there was a shepherd mix, and then there was a pit bull. And uh, they would keep the shepherd always in the cage and they wouldn't feed it. And then they would feed the pit bull in front of it. And it was a really heartbreaking, very traumatic experience. Um, but to watch that shepherd mix learn time and time again, I will not be fed. I will not be loved. I will not be honored. Um, you know, I can't bite because my jaw is going to be bound. And so eventually, I mean, there was a happy story. I ended up <laughs> repeatedly and very dramatically calling the Humane Society. They ended up getting the dogs out. My friends adopted the shepherd mix. Um, and to see that dog transform, it took a really long time because that dog was hardwired to accept abuse as norm. Um, but to see that dog after weeks of being praised, weeks of being loved, weeks of being fed, turn into a different animal. And why do I tell that story is because that just unlocked something in my, my brain that struggles with this concept of how do I really be good to myself? It was, I don't put her in the cage. I don't ask her to accept scraps. I don't bind her jaw when she needs to bite. And, and that idea of like, we're all kind of creatures, we're all animals in the end, and what we're fed, we metabolize. And so I just gained after that, like, really traumatic experience of witnessing an animal continually mistreated and then having to work really hard to, to try and get the animal out of that situation, I realized if I don't do that with the sovereignty of my heart, I'm also in a cage. And if I let myself continually accept mistreatment, 
If I take crumbs and call it a meal, if I don't exit rooms where I'm not called beloved, then I'm doing the same thing. I'm internalizing the same messaging than that dog was. And it just really shifted for me. That is the image that always comes in my mind when I begin to feel myself in a situation that doesn't honor the self. So I don't know. Some people find affirmations really helpful. Some people are able to talk lovingly to myself, uh, to their selves. But for me, it was just this idea of get the dog out of the cage. Don't, don't learn that this is how you're supposed to move in the world. That is very powerful. Um, what a metaphor. And so now (laughs) you've done it. You've done the thing. Um, you have released yourself from every cage really. And, um, I can only imagine, uh, I am lucky enough to have made friends with a handful of poets. Um, and I have famously grew up being, um, I struggled to understand poetry, not like understand why it's precious and meaningful literally understand it. Like my brain would be like, I don't understand what this word means. I don't understand what this metaphor is. Um, I'm logical and I'm kind of analytical. I thought I was going to go into science. And so, um, I, it's been like my great delight a handful of years ago. I was like, I, I have heart. I am a writer. I love love. I love metaphor. I can understand poetry. And so I started like immersing myself in it. Like, that's it. Let's go shock and awe. Like it's all poets all the time. And my whole feed is going to be just poets and poetry. I follow so many. And I have just been so delighted to become sort of awakened and like enlightened and included in the world of poets, which is such a lovely world. It's such a lovely world. So I'm guessing that this was the world that you understand and understood in language like this, in terms like your whole life. Have you been a poet since you were a kindergartner? Well, I would love to say yes, but no, you should no? See, you should see you should see the things I I, I wrote when I was young, the, the the stories that I wrote. But what what I will say is I wasn't a poet early on. I actually came to poetry late, later in life. I um, I went to grad school for poetry when I was about 25, but I had not written many poems previously. When I first came to Page was actually in church, which to loop back on our earlier conversation, I was in uh, churches in Central African Republic and I didn't speak the language yet. And so my mother would let me bring a notebook and a pen and I would write for three or four hours. And so again, I've seen poetry always, or the page always as this way to reconnect with the self. And, you know, I had two older sisters, we were a verbose family, I was often interrupted or drowned out in conversation. The page was the space where I couldn't be interrupted. I could just say my own truth in my own language and the choosiness of that, the sovereignty of that, getting to tell your story with your words, um, with whatever name you choose for yourself. I see it as just this poetry is this beautiful way to access not only self, but to see the world in a really rich and expansive way. Mm, I love to hear that. Um, and, and you are, you had a, obviously an innate gift for it. Um, and for language and ideas. And so interesting to me how poetry is, uh, for me, it, it has, I have learned that it acts as a portal and it, it is able to unlock something in me that just even the best, most instructive language can't do. It's kind of like you said earlier, when the therapist just keeps saying, Say nice words to yourself. Like, I know what you are saying, but I cannot get that it. I can't get that to land. Um, That is sometimes how it is for me where I cannot crack. I cannot get the key to turn the lock until I read a poetic version of that moment. And all of a sudden, like, there it is. It finds its way in. It's such a powerful medium and it matters poetry matters. I just think about the world right now and it's so fragmented and it's operating out of such scarcity and fear and othering and feels scary. I spent a lot of time thinking about this a lot. This is my daily thought loop. 
Um, yeah. Uh-huh. And poetry, uh, I was just going to say that poetry like allows us to put, like it's the only medium to your point that we have that lets us, like it's the only place that can hold the unsayable. That is the definition of a poem. It's the only space that we have that holds that which cannot be spoken in any other art form. And so all of the ache, all of the beauty, all of the impossibility of being alive, that's what poems are for. That's it. And your book's about to come out and everyone's going to get to see for themselves um, what it is that we are talking about, what it is that you put on the page. And I mean, who can't understand the themes of leaving and leaping? Who? Especially, I'm, I'm a decade older than you. I'm, I'm, I will be 50 this year. I don't know anybody in our age range that hasn't dealt with massive change by choice or by force. Either way, there we are. Um, and what it means to take leaps. And so it's just beautiful. I'm so excited for everybody to have it. I'm so proud of you for all the work that it took to get it there. I know that's work. Yes, poets live up in their little beautiful headspace, but also it's work. <laughs> it is work to craft that thing into the final finished product. And so I'm excited for you. And I hope that um, its release is everything that you hope it will be that it's meaningful and it's a con it's connective tissue between all your readers and everyone who's going to find you and that it serves them well. So um, what, this is my last question about this and then we'll wrap it up here. What are you hoping? And I know you're not, you're not writing a template. You're not, you're not handing over a formula. I know that you're not, that's not what poetry is. But even inside of your craft, your medium, what are you hoping, if you are, that your reader like closes that last page and feels or knows um, or walks away with? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for all those kind words. I would say the thing that I always tell people is um, I'm a poet, not a preacher. And my job is not to give any sage advice, but to aptly name the ache. <laughs> And I think if a reader at the end of this book feels like they close it and they have felt like they finally have language, which for so long in my life, I struggled to find, they finally have language to really begin to define for themselves what, wherever it is they're headed and wherever geographical or uh, the West is metaphor symbolically for oneself, whatever it is that they feel a little more in touch with that instinct, with that int intuition, with that life that maybe they haven't had the space to hold or see yet, if they just feel a little bit closer to that, I think I'll be really pleased. Yes. Well, I can tell you as a reader who accidentally stumbled on one of your poems poached from a book that wasn't even released yet and then put on the internet, that's exactly what it did to me. And here we are. I pulled that thing out of the zeitgeist. Um, it just, I mean, it's this long, it's not long at all. And it did that thing for me. And so will you just tell my community, where's the best place to follow you, where to find you, where can they get this book? It's it, uh, right this very second, it's up for pre-order, but it comes out on April 9th. Where are you sending people so that I can do the same? Yeah, absolutely. So you can order it um, at penguinrandomhouse.com. You can um, also follow me at, uh, I'm only on Instagram these days. So at Joy Sullivan Poet is where you can find me. And yeah, I hope you love the book. I'm really excited to get to share it. Yeah, me too. Okay, this is literally the last question. Everybody gets this. Everybody, every series, every guest. Um, this is Barbara Brown Taylor's question that she put in one of her books. And she's been one of those like spiritual guides for me for a lot of years. Answer however you want, Joy. Literally, it could be like nonsense, or it can be like the precious poet's thoughts, like anything in between. Um, her question is, what is saving your life right now? Love that question. Outside of my therapist, I would say, um, I, I recently, I love sad music and I recently changed all the swapped all the sad music on my Spotify for an upbeat indie energetic mix. And it's awful. And it's getting, it's getting me out of bed. So when you're really stressed out about releasing a book, you just got to only listen to upbeat things. It's literally waking me up in the morning. 
That is such a funny answer. I love that so much. My oldest son, Gavin, who just got married this weekend, he only and exclusively listens to sad music. I mean, it's it's endless. The, the playlists are legion. They are this long, every one of them. And it just tickles me so much that you're like, you know what? That's it. Happy songs. Let's go Taylor Swift. Let's 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 just re let's swap it out. Um, that's amazing. I think I I commend your knowledge of your own like brooding heart to be like, uh oh, I need to get up in the top half of the glass. I'm about to release a book. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. I was like, ride or die. We got to, we got to right. this along. <laughs> that's exactly right. Oh, that's so fantastic. Well, I'm so excited for you and i um, grateful that I have found you and found your work. And um, I'm thrilled that the rest of the world is going to have access to, to what it is you do, the special brand of magic that you bring um, to the page. And I am so looking forward for you to begin to hear in a new scale and scope what your words are meaning to people. That cannot be replicated. It is so overwhelming. It's so over the top when your readers start saying they take what you said out of your pen and your experience, and then they apply it in a way that you could not have even imagined. Like you, you can't, you couldn't. And, and they'll tell you. They'll tell you, this is how what this means to me in this moment, and this is why. And it's stunning, and it never gets old, and it is so special. And the fact that we get to write words that mean something to people is such a gift. We are lucky. So I'm excited for you. Thanks Thank for coming you so on the much. show today. Oh, my God. Thank you so much, Jen. This has been such a pleasure. I've, I've really enjoyed chatting with you. Same. All right. I mean, what did I tell you? What did I tell you? The dog story. Like, I just found that inspiring. That That is joy. And that's how she is. And that's how she writes. And I think you can see you are going to want instructions for Traveling West in your hand. Um, Again, like to her point, she's not a preacher. It's not a formula. But it is, it is nonetheless this beautiful path to get to peek in on and draw inspiration from. How wonderful. And so um, if you go over to, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> jenhatmaker.com under the podcast tab. Let me say that again. If you go over to jenhatmaker.com under the podcast tab, I'll have this whole episode. They'll have the show notes. I'll put links to everything. So you can follow Joy so you can find her book. And you can share this. Isn't this a good shareable episode? Uh, as Joy was talking, I kept thinking of the people I wanted to send this to. So um, we love it when you do that. And we love you. Thanks for all. Thanks for subscribing, first of all. Um, and being like such incredible patrons of the show. And all your thanks for rating us and reviewing us. We read all of those, you guys. And then any of your comments when we post our episodes on socials, like we we comb those for your feedback and for your thoughts. And so I just can't, I can't tell you how much we appreciate your engagement and how much we appreciate you. So don't miss anything else in this incredible series on change. And we'll see you next week, guys. <laughs>